Hello and welcome to Think Peace, the podcast with your host, Aaron. I will be here to guide you on your newest journey in the podcast scene. And if you hadn't, this is your first time listening, then I bid you welcome. And thank you for giving my podcast a chance and considering to listen to this for the future. And if you're, like I said, new to this, I also have a newsletter that I publish every week, which is actually the transcript that I read on for every podcast that I do. And so if you want to be multiple steps ahead of what the podcasts are at, by all means, go and sign up for my newsletter and you will receive it every week in your email box. So if you haven't already, you should consider doing that. But if you're just a podcaster, that's perfectly fine too. I'm available on all podcasts uh, where they're all available, where they're all located. So without further ado, we'll, we'll begin with today's podcast. Welcome back to a Think Peace podcast, episode four. This week, we'll have five sections featuring the shorthand, the market, what in the world, out of the loop, quote of the week, life hacks, and a common good. Starting with shorthand. It's Wednesday, my dudes. We made it through the weekend. And now halfway through the week. Only two more days until the next weekend. It's always a pleasure having you reading and listening to my Think Peace podcast. In our new world, the news seems only dark and gloomy, or at worst, just simply overwhelming. So much information everywhere. It's simply just, you just simply burn out and you want to go hide under a rock. In light of this feeling, I figure I'd try to bring all sorts of little goodies. Everything from interesting, thought-provoking, and generally just delightful to read. Or in this case, delightful to listen to. This week, we dive headfirst into the plummeting markets. Then, we visit historical pieces discussing, you know, the collapse of the Soviet Union and how it led to that. Then, the great competition of fishies in Asia. And, if you're not done with that, I even have pieces on the internet and how it's a common good to the whole world. And, you know what? With this week and everything that's been going on with it, why not have a good celebration onto it? And in this one, you know, you can't ever beat it. So, moving on. And now, we move on further to the market. So, at this period of time, the markets were really, really not optimistic. They were just a gloom and doom scenario. Everything from literally, and this is last year, mind you, 2020, the whole upcoming elections, the prospects of a vaccine not coming out by the end of that year, and literally, you had a ton of major companies that were just losing it, literally 25 to 30% of their value in just one week. And another one that I specially focus on in this one was Tesla. It literally, Tesla at the time took a hit and it failed to make the S&P 500 index. And because of that, it lost 30% of its value. But since this is being hindsight, at this point in time, you know, the world looked gloomy and doomy. But as we see now, Tesla not only regained the 30% it lost, but it doubled that as it stands. And sadly, it literally looks like, you know, Bitcoin was plummeting, as it is recently, from its 30, from its, I believe it's 61k, 61,000 value, all the way down to its 31,000. But I have one to beat that. Literally in this one, I'm predicting it is literally going to hit the $11,000 price tag. But it rebounded literally from its 9k, 9,000 value, all the way up to its 10,000. So that's just, you know, a couple of months, not even six or seven months ago that Bitcoin was just hitting, you know, hitting its low points, supposedly in this one. But with that said, 
I took a stab at trying to look at the markets and I took some valuations over some stocks that I personally like to observe and watch. And as I've mentioned in previous episodes, I am not a advisor on this. I don't recommend this is not a full report. This is not any me commending anything or recommending anything. This is literally my personal observations on stuff that I handle myself, which I do not recommend necessarily taking my advice. This is something that you yourself need to take into consideration. Stocks, bonds, municipals, all that sorts. Those are things that you need to research and understand before you dive into them because it may look easy on paper, but in reality, it's actually quite more complicated. But with that out of the way, I'm talking about five companies at this particular time that I am totally digging, or I was digging at the time, or generally what I am still digging. So I started with Tesla, and Tesla has the symbol moniker, the TSLA. So if you're ever looking it up, that's their indicator. Literally, literally it had a loss of $154.70 from a share. And its shares were hitting at the bottom of $324.10. As you know, it's significantly more than that now. But at the time, it started to look grim for these companies. But at this point, we were on the cusp of... I believe seven months into, no, six months into the pan, global pandemic, the economies of the world were just being slammed. Everything looked just, it did not look good. So a lot of your companies were just being just banged up and bruised. My other company I was looking at at the time, AG Mortgage Investment Trust, with the moniker or the indicator MITT. Now, that one lost money as well, but it's not a big stock price. It lost $0.15 on its $2.66 stock value. Now, I have a tendency to look into certain things like, you know, banking and how the current world at the time was looking in the future. That's usually how banking wants to work. You know, they look at the the current situation and they, you know, they're usually focused sometimes on short-term gains, but they always try to look forward in most things. They're always in the prospects that, okay, if people are taking out loans and they're working jobs and whatnot and they got a steady income, well, in 15 to 30 years, they're able to pay off a few things. Or, you know, in the next 10 years, they're going to be paying off a few things. So they're not looking at the six month to a year short term. They're generally looking at the prospects of a five to 10 to 15 to further on 30 year uh, lending period of time. And so whenever you're looking at these sort of stocks or any sort of banking or loans or any sorts of that nature, it's any financial stocks, I mean, it's imperative to look at their overall picture, how they view the trajectory of the world going. And then at that point, simply gauging what you view as the world's taking, like how the world's going to be aiming towards and what kind of progress it's going to have that way. But at this period in time, they've since gained from this initial loss as I, uh, at this time when I was looking at it. But today, they've gained. Another company that was actually, fun fact, originally a SPAC company. It's called Gore Metropolis. It's a South American company. It's a South American oil refining company that I know of. They had at the time gained 25 cents and their share was $11.85. They literally were part of a SPAC. And when they merged, their valuation tripled, if not quadrupled, from their initial holding standards. And, you know... Looking back, that was a good investment at the time, but I also believe SPACs, you know, uh, special acquisition companies are really something to consider as an investment vehicle. I would not recommend them unless you personally look into them and invest and investigate on your own terms and whatever you can and cannot afford. 
take those things into consideration. But me personally, I like them. I still like them, and I participate in you know maneuvering with them and you know buying and selling into them. Needless to say, we press forward. The Sirius XM. Now, anyone that has had a car in the late 2000s will know about Sirius XM, the special premium radio station that you would purchase a membership to, and you'd have hundreds and hundreds of channels to listen to. Everything from, you know, the craziest underground pop and rock to every talk show you could ever imagine to just everything you could ever want in a talk sh- in a radio that you paid for. But since then, they've not really placated to the new and upcoming rivals that they have, such as Apple or, you know, Apple iTunes, um, literally Spotify. They are just not keeping up with the times necessarily. But they do have a tendency to work package deals with cars, such as any of your Fords or any of your like Chevys and stuff, sometimes you'll get like a, if you buy a new car, they'll come prepackaged with Sirius XM radio already in it, and it's maybe some of your other cars from dealerships. That is a a, a um, opening in order for them to try to get you convinced that you should buy radio or buy Sirius XM radio memberships, and that has been. You know, it has met with mixed results in the sense of like how progressive they moved and how progressive or how they've lost money based on that. But at this particular time, it's also, I failed to mention its indicator symbol is S-I-R-I. If you're ever curious to look at it, it at this period of time had lost 22 cents and its original value was at $5.60 from because of that. A lot of companies were losing money, and Sirius was not one of the ones that barely made it out of it. It it took a hit for its shares. But needless to say, that comes with the territory if you are going to be a premium radio station and you know, you're in a pandemic. No one's leaving, no one's driving. And as I mentioned in their prepackaged car purchases, how they had these deals with these car companies and new vehicles, no one's buying a new car. So those deals are not worth anything necessarily. So then, you know, how do you get more listeners? How do you compete against Spotify and Apple and those guys? There's ways, but Sirius is not looking at them, and they're not looking to the future as it stands. Now, the next one is a, if I'm correct, it's C.K. Hutchinson. With an uh, indicator of uh, C K H U Y. At this time, it was a fund. And a fund, I mean, like it was kind of like a grouping where you had several advisors that purchased different stocks and made it, made, um, I guess you would, I would consider them uh, educated guesses at where the markets would go. And that was their whole profession, that they would literally just look at the markets and purchase shares of them in this specific fund. And you would buy this fund being like, okay, I value these guys' decisions and I want to make money because this is what their perspective, like their perspective outcome is. So they were a fund in that sense. Needless to say, these guys were not also doing well at this time. They were losing 13 cents on the dollar from the share of $6.23. But, you know, since then, I have I've actually gained my money back on some of these guys and more and then got rid of them because I mean, what are you supposed to do? Are you going to hold I mean, it really depends on the style of marketing you're going to be doing the style of banking financing however you're planning your future your current livelihood or just in general spare money and change you're wanting to deal with you have to have a goal whenever you're dealing with stock markets and such so i always recommend before you ever take anyone else's advice before you ever jump into this seemingly vast ocean of just numbers and everything else and companies and just all craziness do your research. Absolutely go read and just get a grasp of it. 
and I recommend reading and looking up the general, just basic knowledge on this stuff before you even try. Because otherwise, it's just going to be a loss of money, it's going to hurt, and it'll feel a lot like gambling. And God knows you don't need to be trying to do gambling now. <laughs> on top of all the alcohol we've been drinking in these pandemic, you can't be doing that now, can you? So this is where I usually have a link to one of the two app, two or three apps I use predominantly. Now, I this is me personally, what I personally use. And I can't say it would be best for you to use it, but it's really intuitive and I only have ever had one or two problems with the program itself and it's Robinhood for your phone. Now I use it off and on. I mean I've used ones like E-Trade, Fidelity, uh, Charles Schwab, those guys and they're pretty good as well but I always have a tendency to hit uh, Robinhood on this one so I absolutely you know if you're looking to get into this again I highly recommend don't take my advice personally on it. I'm not an advisor. I'm not a financial advisor. Not any of that. Or a market person in that sense. But I highly recommend looking into it, researching it, and just getting your bearings straight before you start heading on. Like, I'm going to be purchasing some bonds. going to be purchasing some stocks. Absolutely need to know what you're doing before you do it. What? And that is a wrap on the market. Now, moving on... Now, continuing to our next section in this epilogue, what in the world? Our first article of importance is making a stand. The European nation of Chesnia, or the Czech Republic, has done what few other nations are willing to do. It picked policies based on values and rights instead of ones based on wealth and power. With the president of the Senate, which I will butcher his name severely, I apologize, Milios Vindistrius, I apologize, visited Taiwan and made a speech to the legislative yuan of Taiwan. The message was made clear. I am Taiwanese. Now, this is a sing signaling a break between the Chesnian and the Chinese close relations in a new era of great power competition. Chesnia is just the second country to recognize Taiwan as an independent country, Somalian, Somaliland first. So what does this really mean? Well, it's a signal to smaller nations around the world that they don't have to suffer what bigger powers force upon them, which is a big hand to the face of the current foreign policy China has been using on many nations through their debt trap economic policies, which has been focused on smaller nations that work or want to cooperate with China economically or benefit off the Chinese's massive absorbent wealth. But this kind of challenge to the Chinese will not be taken lightly and appears that the Czechs will be receiving the stick from here on out in their bilateral relations. If the U.S. honors its Taipei Act, as it previously promised, all will not be lost for, Czech, for the Czechs. Same goes to the EU and with Germany supporting the Czech actions. So, in theory, from this point, the Czechs were one of the first countries to really stand up to the Chinese in the sense of standing with Taiwan and Taiwan's desperate attempt for independence, which is becoming a hot spot for the area, considering all things between Taiwan looking for independence from China and avoiding the Chinese uh, integration of their efforts too, which China has declared that any acts to keep Taiwan independent or to interfere with Taiwan will be a direct act of aggression and will not be tolerated by the Chinese, which chi China considers Taiwan a wayward province. So, in the sense of this, this is a public outcry and a consideration of great importance in the sense of international diplomacy and efforts being held accountable by great powers. In the sense of, you know, it will not be looked down upon as other nations will just stand by and watch as, you know, China and other great powers such as them just have their way with the world and their economies. Now, moving to the next. 
And in our next article, Cooperation Isn't Dead. U.S. and Vietnam developed a new relationship bound by the promise of future generations by setting up the Young Southeast Asian Leaders Initiative Academy at the Fulbright University, Vietnam, in Ho Chi Minh City. It's in cooperation with the U.S. This program will be aimed at entry and mid-level professionals of ASEAN nations in fields such as technology and in technology, innovation, public policy, and entrepreneurship. The project is aimed to begin in 2021 with renewed support and interest. The idea in this, obviously, aside from basic cooperation, is to build a kindredship with one another. The U.S., recently, as said, last four years, has been very, very hostile to anything involving cooperation, has been very aggressive at dismantling all multilateral and bilateral agreements in any retrospect, unless the current administration, or the previous administration, was adamant about destroying anything and everything that was the PowerPoints of the United States and its foreign policy. So with this alone, it's very optimistic for what the future will hold for United States and Vietnam and the future of other foreign um, policy policy holders or potentiality for anything that comes in the future between any cooperation. So this is a positive step in the right direction. From that, though, we move to shooting fish in a barrel. More and more nations are competing for fishing rights in the South China Sea at the expense of both security and fish stockpiles. One of Asia's richest marine ecosystems, an estimated 504.4 million tons of fish have been caught from 1950 to 2014, the largest anywhere in Asia. In recent years, China has claimed up to 80% of the South China Sea as its sovereign territory, which would include the rich marine resources in it. This has spurred a massive jump in Chinese fishing vessels that venture far, far and beyond to get the biggest catches at the determinant of relations with their neighbors and fish and of the fishing population, the fish population, excuse me. In addition to the increased fishing, the Chinese Coast Guard has been patrolling and sinking other nations' fishing vessels, many in even in their own country's exclusive economic zones, or EEZs. Many nations have claims and competing interests in the regions in the region for its untold wealth of both underwater fossil fuels marine li- and marine life. But the Chinese have the economic weight and muscle to force others around in this sector. The biggest victims, though, are, is the marine life due to the sheer overfishing and rampant illegal fishing activities caused by these competing interests, which, in fact, the Chinese in this were technically the ones that just spearheaded just hundreds and hundreds of thousands of fishing vessels just allowed to venture off into anywhere that China deemed was their sovereign waters and just do as they will to the ecosystems and countering and fighting others literally to the extremes of there were oftentimes many sunken old rigs or junks that were sunk in many of the oceans or the seas surrounding other countries like the Philippines, Malaysia, uh, Indonesia, Vietnam, and then these other nations and their sovereign waters. And this has also been a very, very, what you would consider a gray area for showing dominance in the region and showing who is in charge. And China has been adamantly doing this for many years and has really pushed this notion of you know their sovereign waters their actions nobody else has a right in it and it has been to the detriment of international relations and cooperation but more importantly to the marine life because it's simply a matter of overfishing schools and populations because if you have one ship to ten ships in one area 
originally like one small area of fish population. Now you have a hundred to a thousand ships that are doing the exact same thing in the same area in shorter spans of time, which doesn't allow the populations of the fish and the other marine life to recuperate from the previous fishing expeditions and then it's just a gradual degradation of the ecosystems the destruction of fauna and flora and it's just a situation that just causes more and more harm to our ecosystems which you know competing interests are and competing nations are not concerned with in the sense because they're concerned with their own sovereign territories their own needs of the country not concerned with the ecosystems so it is a very very concerning situation in this atmosphere now moving on to our next section thanks guys for tuning in and listening to my podcast if you are interested, I have an l- assortment of all kinds of cool shirts, t-shirts, everything from tank tops, hoodies, I got masks, I got maps, and all sorts of cool designs that I think you would enjoy. So if you enjoy my channel and want to find a way to support, go check out my store down here in the link below. All right, so this one's out of the loop section. Can you measure fear? Well, this seems to be the case when you are dealing with stocks anyway. The fear index, CBOE volatility index, or VIX, V-I-X, does just that. For a brief understanding of it, it's to measure the volatility of markets for 30 days. Investors use it to gauge how best to maneuver the markets, ranging from the Dow to many foreign markets like the Japanese Nikkei. So, before you decide to dive straight into the investment scene, you should give this index a glance. There's even options to trade the VIX. Whoever said fear wasn't valuable certainly didn't live in our age. Or, actually they do profit from it. And the fact that we've made it into a profitable system is very disconcerting to say the very least. But I digress. Moving on to our next one. Constellations are more than just stars. In an effort to provide everyone with internet access, SpaceX is bringing it to you via the stars. Recently, or in this period, SpaceX applied for the Federal Commission Communications Commission Commission, excuse me, FCC to change the altitude of their satellites to 540 to 570 kilometers, while also decreasing the number of satellites to 4409 in low earth orbit. In recent beta testing, it was deemed that this altitude would improve latency and consistency. Quote, results from beta initial tests have shown both low latency below 30 ms or milliseconds and download speeds greater than 100 megabytes per second. Quote, which will allow them to reach areas that are inaccessible by traditional means and match the current capacity of landlines. Though there is a concern with the light pollution these satellites will have on scientists and astronomers viewing the night sky. SpaceX has made efforts to alleviate both of those fears, but that may not be enough in the case for its competitors. Which seems, in the future, the night sky will no longer be quiet or empty. So, the idea that this has progressed substantially since I've wrote about it in this piece they have usually launched between 100 to 500 satellites per every other dragon mission as it seems or falcon 9 mission and honestly i am torn between both enjoying the idea that the possibility of internet being accessible in any part of the world and remote areas is a boon to everything in our society. While at the same time, the idea of losing our night sky to these drones or satellites that just hover above the atmosphere and have a tendency to block out most of your night sky in the sense of like, you will see 
if you look in the night sky and you're in an area without any trees or say any light pollution like cities and such, you'll see the abundance of stars. And oftentimes you'll see some stars that move about the little white lights that just go across this horizon. You watch them and you're like, huh, that's a shooting star. No, it's a satellite. So imagine seeing a bunch more of those little lights going across your sky. It's quite sad to think about the possibility of not being able to see the true night sky anymore. So it is with heavy handed gains and also hesitation that we await for the future that is coming to us regardless of our choices in life. So with that fun and optimistic article passing, we go to our next one and final one in our section. All empires come to an end, which is a glorious term I've heard in a while. Some, though, simply implode from the inside out, such as the case of the Soviet Union. Now, this issue lies with the state's inability to reform or change, where the powers that control, where the power that powers that control either cannot due to a complete change of ideology or they simply choose not to to comfort to in order to maintain its status quo such is the case of the Soviet Union. Soviet dissident writer, which I will butcher his name, I apologize, Andrei Almerich, wrote about such a prevailing issue that faced such empires, where comfort cult is so pervasive that it makes those of us believe reason will succeed and everything will be okay. Quote, when, in the end, a seemingly minor issue becomes a crisis and begins to create a string of further crises, history always has a uniquely human answer to human problems. One can learn from the failures of their past, which is very, very interesting in the sense of how we really, it's a good read in the sense of how current empires, current countries and current powers of the world are operating in this day and age. I won't quote any names or specify any certain places, but it's a very, very interesting concept. It's a very interesting read and make comparisons to a, to history in general, but also in our current day and age, which is always the reasons why I'm always reading history. So I can have an a idea of what will come in the future which humanity has a tradition of never wanting to change and change being forced upon them and the only reasons why humans ever are compelled to change. But with that last article, we end our out of the loop section. Thus, moving on further. And now moving right along to the special sections where I have personally wrote the articles themselves. And... They're further real good reads, so I highly recommend everybody have a chance to read them, since these are just short little blurps about them. But we'll start with the section, Life Hacks. We all know many who love to travel, and then there's some that don't, and that's fine too. But for some of those that think traveling is a daunting challenge, well guess what? We got you covered. In this article, I specifically talk about talk about the tips and tricks of traveling around the world and some advice that you may need not even just traveling around the world but maybe even just traveling down to the street next to you at the small park down the street from you who knows but these tips and tricks are valuable in any and all ways you can use them especially for those would be rvers or potentially backpackers or hey whatever you might be go for it and our next one A common good. Now, I took a serious note on this one, aside from my favorite parts of traveling, and I took on a subject that is real dear and deep to my heart. Our way of life has changed dramatically. One simply cannot simply go to work, order food, make a phone call, or honestly function in the modern world without the internet. So why are there still people on this world who are forced to live without it? Here, in this article, I propose a plan to change the way we look at internet. Instead of looking at it as a, what you would consider a privilege, we look at it, or, you know, an entertainment outlet similar to that of the TV or of that sorts, you know, 
look at it as like a utility, a social good for all, a share, you know, a social good for all to share and benefit from equally. It is something that is critical in our modernizing world. You, we live in a period of time where everyone from the youngest of the youngest to the oldest of old that has a cell phone. And with that comes nine times out of 10 internet. And we literally live our pandemic alone. Since this is an update from a current version of the previous writings has ex- shown us significantly more how important the internet is for our, not only our day to day lives, but also our work our work lives as well from the simple fact of remote work was the rise of zoom and other companies similar to that to where you had to have internet connection of some quality in order to be able to just function or do basic routine things at work from your computer at home and a lot of people couldn't do that and it was simply due to the fact of the limits of how we look at internet Specifically, cable and internet providers that are entirely dominant and have built these infrastructure networks that are limited or limiting our abilities to really fully develop a area or a group of people in order to, you know, maximize our capabilities. And it is, I believe in this article alone which I highly recommend everyone take a gander at it. In it, I explain how that viewpoint of looking at it as a privilege instead of a need is it's obscure, it's absurd, it's a relic of the past, and we need to move it from the position of a privilege to a right. Yes, it's a bold statement. Yes, it's a bold concept. But at the same time, you could easily make an argument for how much our lives are affected by the internet and if you have it compared to if you don't have it how much your potential potential to grow develop or provide or maximize your abilities or capabilities in society are really limited i mean for example much of your role role areas or your real farmlands and areas that are very underpopulated woodlands and very obscured obscurely located areas are really back backwaters for any form of internet i mean you can barely find it at re- dial up speed for a reasonable price without paying 100 200 dollars for dial up speed internet whereas you know you could go to bigger cities where there's fiber optic google fiber optic there's every variety of internet choice you could have at your disposal and it's you know cheap comparatively like between 20 29.99 all the way up to you know you pay 100 for like 10 or 15 gigs a day of quality internet that you can upload in the span of you know that's the kind of speeds you get for uploading and downloading i mean you can sit here in some big cities and have a streaming Netflix and then have you know downloading stuff and then uploading stuff all at the same time and five five or six computers linked up and four or five phones and still have enough bandwidth to just do everything compared to to going out into the mountainous areas of Appalachia Kentucky or Tennessee and literally you sit there and spin on dial-up equivalency speeds and you get one or two phones on it or heaven forbid you get a computer and a phone on there and you're you you can't stream there's almost no possibility of doing that and it's just it's it's a matter of internet companies service providers refuse to go out into these areas simply because there's not enough money or incentive to get out to there so you know it's just not worth it to build the infrastructure for it so that's the part where it's more government because government can necessarily foot the bill and create incentives to these companies you know these companies can lease or rent the internet the backbone internet like we have seen prior and it can make its money back but the government has to be the initiator or the initiative 
in it because just like in space where it was 90 percent dominated since the 60s all the way up until the early 90s and 2000s the government was a dominant space traveler or the dominant space uh you know investor and then now you have the advent of spacex blue origin and all these other companies commercialized space companies that are now taking over the lion's share of what the government initially did the government brings down the cost of entry and proves it's a viable substance for other companies to do it and then you have the government that has built this institution has built this structure and creates the rules of engagement and then you have companies that enter into it and bring down the cost even further so then you know these companies are not exploiting it's identical to the fact of how facebook twitter and these other social media companies had inner sphere that was uncharted unknown and it wasn't maybe unknown but it wasn't something that was on the registers of the government and such so then you have these companies that just run rampant and you have events where you have disinformation is just running rampant worse than an epidemic of you know equivalency and if there was no government there to make rules and regulations that governed how each of these companies are allowed to interact or allowed to go their concept like in facebook's for example is a prime example is um keep going until you break it and then once you break it then you know try to fix it or not even fix it just keep breaking further which is exactly what facebook has done and is what continuously facebook does and it's you either get that sort of scenario or you get the scenario like with the my best example is it wasn't used in the article so that's why i'm using this one more liberally in the sense of the space commercializing space where space was dominated by the government because one of expenditures two because government held a strong monopoly on it and then now has gradually brought down cost so then commercialized space companies are becoming a thing and they're actually taking over the line like i said prior they're taking over the market share of the government in space and so now you have majority of missions that spacex is launching into uh blue origins atlas um lucky those guys are launching spaceships and launching rockets and satellites into space for private companies and governmental agencies and you know they are adhering to the rules set by the government and it doesn't deter their business it doesn't hurt their business they're becoming extremely profitable and it is getting competitive See, the problem is you have a lot of people that have a tendency to look at government and say, oh, well, government's evil, government's bad. And, well, at the same time, it's it's a necessary evil in the entry of something to set down the guidelines and the rules. Because imagine this, for anybody that's an American, football, not in the sense of soccer's terms, but in American football, if there were no rules of engagement, if there were no boundaries no limits no fouls no referees then what's the concept of the sport it doesn't make sense you don't you know it's it's not a limit on how far they can go or how far or how much they can do there is a guideline to where everybody has a fair enough shot and it just takes someone who's smarter who's braver who's more um who can see things that other people can't opportunist and it doesn't limit the enjoyment factor doesn't limit the success factor it doesn't limit anything aside from complete and utter chaos and destruction that seems to reign supreme whenever an initiative is taken and there are no rules for its engagement or how it's practiced thus my argument comes to with the internet there i list them in my article of how many instances where internet service providers routinely take advantage of government institutions uh, private companies individuals countless times and if anyone has ever had to call customer service about their phone they will understand exactly what i'm talking about when it comes to the just disregard for your time the disregard for it doesn't matter if you you know you are 
a customer for 10 years or a customer for one month, they will treat you the exact same garbage. And they lock you into these contracts where you're penalized for every little thing you do. And it's just, it's, there's no negotiation. There's no mediation. There's no middle ground. It's all you do as they say, if you want to deal with them and they're all the same and they all play by their own rule books, but competition makes them more, you know, lot, following each other a little bit closely sure you have the fcc and some of those institutions but even them you know it's so limited and where internet is like i said before it's considered a privilege instead of the necessity which is absurd at this stage in our in this late stage capitalism and late stage uh uh world we live in to where it isn't. It isn't a privilege. Privilege. It isn't a obscurity like that. And it's a mindset that people need to get out of, honestly, moving forward into the future. And if we're going to have a competitive edge against, say, other countries that have ballooned in size, wealth, and um, strength in central governments and such like that, to be authoritarian regimes that can just do whatever they want, we must extend the opportunities of the world to every American citizen and every individual that has the capacity to access the internet and provide something. It's an opportunity to maximize the capacity of every human being, regardless if they go and look on it for cat videos on TikTok or if they're using it to access their Excel spreadsheets for their company or working, uh, taking tickets or orders for a customer service company. It doesn't matter. It's the simple fact that it is one, it is not a luxury, it's a necessity in the day to day lives of the modern 21st century. And for any modern developed nation and underdeveloped nation, it is critical to have these not only infrastructure built in order to handle the ever-growing needs and appetites of a populace that wants, that wants to pursue further in progress and do better, but it is essential to growing, developing, and prospering, uh, prospering in a human society of this day and age. But I can go on this tangent, obviously, for days, but I will not do it further because my Article 1 is excellently held, handled, and I hit a lot of good points regarding everything I've been talking about. But I delve into a different atmosphere. I delve into a different institution and many examples that are, you know, excellent to this read. So if you haven't read it, it's called The Internet Necessity, Not a Luxury. And I'll have a link below and you need to read it. And if you don't read it, then what are you really even doing here? I mean, come on, let's get on this. So, and before we continue further, our quote of the week in this podcast is by Michael Palin, and it's, I never think, oh, I've done all that, that's it, that's over. I know until the end of my life, there'll always be somewhere I'll want to go, and that I've not been to, and that's what sort of things keep you young. So, I always enjoy a good travel quote, and I recommend anybody who hasn't looked at a quote in a while, to go out and find one. I find a good one. But that is yours for today if you want to take it as such. Now, I am wrapping up this podcast. And it feels like it's been long overdue. And it actually has been long overdue. But it's a it's it's pleasant to have a conclusion. It's pleasant to have it finish. And you know, it's been enjoyable for the most part. So I like to thank you all for sticking to it listening to me ramble on about subjects that are either near and dear to me or just pleasant to talk about or just absurd to the point where I had to tell somebody. And for that, I thank, thank you one and all. And if you haven't yet, be sure to check out my other podcasts. And if that doesn't wet your whistle enough, then I do have a weekly uh, newsletter that I release that this podcast is based off of, which I'm currently uh, working on the older uh, think piece bit, uh, think piece, uh, pieces. 
if you will. And so if you want to stay up to date and keep up with my whereabouts and what's going on, it's an absolute must to sign up. So I'll have the links below. Go down there, sign up, check them all out. And if you haven't thought about it, then consider having a good day. Possibly. And till next time.